bringing life harnessing hydrogen to the sun feeding the sun helping the sun nurturing the sun would be increased beyond a factor of eight and I've said this before so not only would we be bringing life to a planet and therefore giving us a, another place to live but we would also be bringing life and greater awareness and help to our own sun in increasing the attraction of comets into the solar system so this is a significant watershed it is showing that we have the ability to create planets that allow us to sustain our species and if our species is on two planets then our chance of survival is immeasurably improved and if we bring life in such a fashion then to the stars that support those planets we are changing our relationship with something as vast as the Sun so how do we build this and I'm sorry if I'm rushing too quickly and I'm sorry if I'm stuttering a bit here but I'm trying to get this visualization through so the design if you click on the link design on the top there of give hyphen life.org on Phoenix uh, principles and then click on design we explain in theory the type of idea so a Phoenix space station would be placed in a stable orbit around about 36,000 to 40,000 kilometers from Mars and it would create um, a series of giant arms and these giant arms would extend out for some uh, kilometers and so we are dealing with very large uh, engineering projects but not impossible but certainly larger than anything we've done in space before now if you've seen what they do with ships uh, particularly old warships when they've served their purpose and they blow them up and they turn them into reefs this is something that they've done off the coast of Australia a number of times in the space of a few years nature converts those wrecks into sanctuaries for fish into life and that it increases the life around it immeasurably when it's done properly so here we don't have to fill in every single inch of the moon we don't have to spend millennia having to pat down and, and create the moon if we create the structure necessary then the Sun and the solar system itself will help bring the fill and the remainder together so the way we see that is in step two phase two and I'm looking at uh, give hyphen Mars dot life dot org uh, Phoenix Phoenix design so phase two you see that Phobos and Deimos have been brought into the structure and placed into a permanent fixture and then what would need to happen is that other objects from the asteroid belt would need to be brought in to also provide uh, a stable base and this would take tens of years and require skill but over time what would happen is that uh, once these pieces are in place then a series of space stations would then be connected on the outer rims and the first space station the Phoenix space station in its design would be converted from a station to a reactor and as a reactor its purpose then would be to pro be providing uh, an energy source uh, to provide the propulsion of this structure into a rotation uh, orbit now by rotating and by having its own energy fields through its own reactor when you look at phase five and phase four but certainly by phase five what you see is that this will attract interstellar dust another small rock to accrete into 
the structure. In fact, the moon will start to assemble itself. And by phase six, in the space of 60 years, 60 to 100 years, the moon itself will start to solidify. It will start to fill in and Mars will have a stable moon approximating the same dimensions and the same effects as we see on Earth. And we will be able to create the same living conditions on Mars as we require to live unaided on the surface of Mars as we do on the surface of Earth. So that's the visualization. It is possible to do it. Yes, it is massive, unprecedented, complex, at times dangerous. But the net result of this is we can bring life to a dead planet. We can create our second home and we can do it within 100 years. So that's the first visualization that it is possible to create an artificial moon, it is possible to compress the atmosphere of Mars, and it's possible to bring life to Mars. So now we deal with the second visualization. And this is the one that I truly ask you to focus very carefully on. If indeed Elenin is a brown dwarf or a dark star, and there's some indication that this is what we're dealing with. If we're facing, whether it is or isn't, the change in the crust of our Earth, then all the change that's taking place is because the Sun, as a conscious being, chooses this time as the appropriate time. As I've said before, our existence and the sustainment of life on planet Earth is because the sun wills it, not because it's an accident of nature, not because we're stuck on some mechanical clock, but because consciously the sun wills it. If the sun decided that life on Earth was unnecessary, it could destroy us any second of any day. So the arrival of Elenin, the changes on our planet, and everything that's taking place is because of this great plan, this conscious willing and decision that this is the time. Now, with our visualization that in accordance with the covenant of one heaven, we are committed to the idea and to seeing that idea come true, that as a species, we will focus our greatest engineering project to be the bringing of life to Mars. That is our primary goal for the next 100 years. This is our commitment and our promise. This is fundamental to being a member of Eucadia. If you're a member of Eucadia, the fact that in 100 years, the biggest project that we face is the bringing of life to Mars, then to the sun we ask, if our society, our civilization is damaged to the point of catastrophe, our ability to follow through on that promise is severely compromised. Clearly, our ability to fulfill that is compromised. Yes, our computers should be better engineered. They are susceptible to electromagnetic radiation. Yes, we're building space stations that can be destroyed by something the size of a coffee cup. Yes, uh, rockets are badly designed and we haven't mastered the forces of the universe. We certainly have uh, limited, still limited knowledge of the use of materials. But for all our faults, if the sun chose in this transition period to cause major catastrophe to civilization across the world, then our ability in the next 100 years to fulfill this promise would be almost impossible. So we not just ask the sun, 
that we now visualize the sun accepts our message. So feel what it's like to be on a beautiful summer's day with the sun in your face. The sun is saying to you, yes, I understand that if this transition period destroys you, then I will not see life being brought back to Mars in any time soon and I will not see my own life being enhanced. I, the sun, have a vested interest in seeing that this comes true so that whatever happens, it will be to help towards this aim, not to hurt it. So that if there is change, it will be change to help change awareness. If there is change, it will be part of this process. It will be unavoidable. But you will not be destroyed by this process. Because if I destroy you, I destroy my future. We are linked now. We are bonded now. We are equal now because we are faced with a mutual agreement of prosperity or destruction. And so our agreement in the covenant holds true as equals. Together, we prosper, sun and homo sapiens species. Together we prosper or we fail. So our visualization is as these objects arrive, their trajectory, their tail, their effect are minimized. And those that monitor these things will be amazed by this, the miracle that this represents. Because in their mechanistic view of the world, if an object is heading to us, it is unavoidable. It is mathematics. It is a machine. Consciousness does not exist. We're animals. We have no effect. In that world, a change in trajectory, a change in events is a miracle. So we don't have to visualize Ellen and changing movement because that's up to the sun all we have to focus on is the fact that we have an agreement a sacred and solemn and historic agreement to the sun we will bring greater life to our sun we will pay homage to our sun we will respect ourselves and our future by bringing life to mars and in doing so we ask that as part of that agreement, the sun honour the necessity for us to continue our civilization, so that we can fulfil our destiny. And that is the visualisation. Well, as far as the uh, immediate issues that we have are concerned, Uh, Let's switch back to some of the issues that I know that you are all facing. I hope that visualization helps, and I hope that helps you all. And I do ask that you do think about what we're talking about in terms of the visualization of our future. But let's bring that back to our, our immediate concerns now, because we can focus and meditate together on what uh, we can influence. But I know that one of the pressing or number of pressing problems that you will face, of course, back to the here and now. We've spoken a few weeks ago about the housekeeping matters of clearing up some of confusion that is on a number of the sites. And I'm sorry that it's taking so long to clear up a number of these things. I am pleased that a number of you have spoken about and thought about this concept of one cause one cure, one remedy, one action. That when you throw everything in the kitchen sink at your problems, when you start shotgunning things at your problems, then really you're giving those that are attacking you an opportunity to pick the weakest of your arguments and use that to have all of it thrown out. But I want to come back to a couple of things that have been discussed 